Hello, my name is Tom Coughlin, and it's my great pleasure and honor to be able to introduce the usual host of the podcast, HPE's podcast, From Research to Reality, Dehan. Hey, Tom. Hi. Good to see you again. Today, we're going to talk about predictions. And Dehan, why are predictions important? Well, predictions were always there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Pythia, the old mm -hmm. uh, woman from the ancient times who was predicting things. Then over the ages, people like to predict. Other people like to hear predictions, either to hear the future or to cheer when predictions were not made. Mm -hmm. Uh, but nowadays, I think predictions are extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen that with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, everyone was clueless what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just doctors, but also the regulators, they wouldn't know when to close the towns, when to close the stores, when to open up, mm -hmm. how to trade off uh, economy for health. Mm -hmm. survival, you know, for the uh, uh, other aspects. Mm -hmm. So suddenly predictions are becoming extremely important. Okay. And how did you first start getting involved with uh, predictions? Well, I still remember it was about 10 years ago on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. We went and I, I vividly remember when one lady who was the marketing director at that time of Computer Society, mm -hmm. uh, she wanted just to uh, collect some information about interesting topics. Mm -hmm. Uh, for various magazines and others. We, we had a meeting of Industry Advisory Board mm -hmm. of Computer Society. Mm -hmm. And the first time she just asked for the input. Next mm -hmm. time we met, I said, well, you know, l let's do it more seriously, let's vote. Mm -hmm. And soon you have seen more sophisticated, you know, researchers, engineers, mm -hmm. we start introducing concepts, yep. processes, and, 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 and after a while we, we are coming up with uh, a more rigorous process where we have uh, a number of people who vote, mm -hmm. uh, vote for likelihood, uh, vote for uh, how important technology is, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about is that Computer Society uh, predictions in 2022. How impactful has that been? Oh yeah, that's uh, uh, one special instance. Yeah. So yeah. Um, at around 2013, about 10 of us mm -hmm. got together mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to do a more, even more rigorous prediction mm -hmm. of what kind of technologies will be there. And we picked up randomly 2022. Mm -hmm. It was a peculiar number, seven years away, seven, eight years away from when we started it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we ended up with 23 technologies that we thought would mm. be impactful by 2022. Mm. It took us over a year, maybe two years to write it down. Mm -hmm. But when I look back, and today is year 2022, yes. we predicted a number of technologies just right. You know, high performance computing. Mm. We just had an announcement of Frontier for Exascale. Mm -hmm. At that time, we were talking about the future of Exascale. We spoke about uh, robotics, uh, computer vision, and many other about sustainability, mm -hmm. many other important topics that are really popular today. And how are predictions important to the world, to your company, as well as to industry, government, and academia? Well, you know, you may think that it's just a bunch of people who have fun predicting. Mm -hmm. But in reality, uh, there are trends that companies are very interested in, in, in finding out about. Because if you know what the trends are, then you can plan your product lines, your roadmaps. That's for industry. Mm -hmm. Academia, obviously, always wants to do research on interesting and important things mm -hmm. that, that are relevant to the, the, the whole world. And then legislators, similarly, mm -hmm. you know, they want to know that climate change is really a critical topic so mm -hmm. that they can you know, prepare funds, invest in it, and, and then there's competition uh, across regions of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And why are predictions important to IEEE? Well, IEEE, as, as, as I mentioned, has started these predictions with the mm -hmm. Industry Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the years, uh, we've done much more. Mm -hmm. um, it's not only about prediction of technologies, but also about roadmaps. Mm -hmm. So we use uh, roadmaps to inform the world of what will the future technologies be, what we, which will be coming onto the market. This is an even more so rigorous process where uh, 
representatives from various companies, from academia, from government get together. So ITRS was one mm -hmm. extremely critical over, I think over 20 years they got together mm -hmm. and, and they were able to inform uh, everyone what are the next technologies. And nowadays they transform into something called IRDS. Mm -hmm. So it used to be in part of IEEE now. I think. Part of IEEE, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And who are you working with on predictions? Well, first of all, I work with you, yes. but you're not the only one. Uh, I in invited uh, the people with similar mindset. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Roberto Soraco was independently of me mm -hmm. doing the same in, in COMSOC, mm -hmm. Communication yep. Society. Uh, I invite people who I like to work with. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, uh, called Faraboski in mm -hmm. Hewlett Packard Labs, who I've been working for years on this mm -hmm. topic, Ethan Frachtenberg. Um, uh, I invite people who have something to say, uh, Hironori Kasahara, mm -hmm. uh, our incoming uh, president of Computer Society, Nita Patel, not because mm -hmm. she's president, not because of the functions, but those people who are interesting, like you, you've been writing for Forbes mm -hmm. and, and you have been predicting technologies yourself. That's why I wanted you. Yeah. Nita Patel knows about software development, mm -hmm. Hironori Kasahara, even though the, uh, one of the presidents of, of, of his university and professor is actually uh, quite knowledgeable about compilers. Mm -hmm. So th these are people who, who you know, can see beyond the next hump. You know, because a lot of people, you know, there's a hump and they can't see beyond it. Mm -hmm. Those who have eyesight to see either through or over the hump are those that I like to work with. And how do you deliver the predictions? Well, there are different ways. Uh, original ones was simply a list of topics that was handed to mm -hmm. um, various editorial boards that used it to do their editorial calendars. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, 2022 was, I think, over 200 pages report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we decided, we, we realized that predictions are really not traditional papers. Mm -hmm. uh, they could be like this report, but Usually the audience likes to hear very quick summary. So uh, we do uh, press releases. It's mm -hmm. usually a web page. Mm -hmm. And I like to do the graphs because graphs, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand um, uh, words. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. same way this podcast is probably worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> but, but once you see these mm -hmm. graphs that compare the likelihood of uh, predictions and desirability mm -hmm. and the maturity and the impact. Mm -hmm. You know, in one picture you can say 16 different stories about mm -hmm. technologies and you can spend quite a bit of time and, and, and derive all kinds of insights yeah. from there. Yeah. Now you and I work together on the technology predictions for the IEEE Computer Society. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples in 2020 of the 2022 predictions and uh, uh, I guess there's two in particular I'd like to get mm -hmm. your input on. One is uh, data-centric AI will increase the focus on uh, improving data quality and on data fabrics to make data available everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the first one uh, actually came from Paolo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but it's kind of very intuitive, non-trivial mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. predict it, but it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. They say trash in, trash out. Mm -hmm. So it's good so, data. So if you have good data, you'll have mm -hmm. good uh, AI that will derive insights from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so really this AI has to be data-centric. We need to focus mm -hmm. on data, not just on these models mm -hmm. that you learn from, mm -hmm. even though these models are created uh, from the training data. So that's the one mm -hmm. and, and it's extremely important because we're now using AI everywhere. The, the other one was uh, a convergence of uh, HPC uh, AI and HPDA uh, yeah, delivered we, as a service. Yeah. yeah, we've seen that almost everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, because we have these three areas, mm -hmm. high performance computing and suddenly they care a lot about AI mm -hmm. because they are reaching the limit of the scaling of these supercomputers. Mm -hmm. Even though we mentioned earlier the Frontier uh, just delivered as a scale and we hope to continue to march towards Mm -hmm. Zeta scale, but the march won't be using the same routes. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are using now GPUs that are delivering some of these uh, exascales. So similarly, here we'll be using other AI accelerators mm -hmm. in order to deliver some of these flops. Mm -hmm. uh, so AI is required and it's bringing accelerators along the line. And then there's data analytics mm -hmm. because there's so much data that you need to express, usually in the form of graphs, and then you need to traverse these graphs. That's used in uh, social networks and intelligence communities. 
and, and, and literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so to conclude this uh, prediction, uh, we also thought that with this plethora of accelerators, there'll be a need for finer grain virtualization, which is serverless, mm -hmm. which kind of intuitively matches the kernels that run on these accelerators, short-lived kernels, mm -hmm. to the short-lived and small abstractions or function as a service delivered as a serverless. And how do you know when your predictions are coming true? Well, you know, you are making these predictions and a year later you look at <laughs> your own self and go deep down in your you know, soul and say, well, was I really right or was I wrong? Mm. And then there's your buddies who you did these predictions too. They look at your eyes as well. And we all sit together and then it's really hard to decide how successful you are because originally we said, well, how far out are we going to make predictions? Is it going to be a year, five years, 20 years? And you can't constrain these guys to say, you have to do it in a year because some technologies are longer term. Mm -hmm. So we said, we're going to measure how much progress has this technology made during the last year. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going to be delivered in 20 years from now or one year. Mm -hmm. So quantum computing, you know, we tried predicting a few times. Mm -hmm. Didn't advance too much, but it's still popular. Mm -hmm. And then there are much other similar or dissimilar technologies that, that we look at and say, well, how much progress has it made? So what is the, uh, what would you say the success ratio has been in these predictions? Well, on average, I think we were rated around B plus, mm -hmm. which is not that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had A plus, we had D minus as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I also worked on the future of the workforce. You know, uh, can you tell us a bit about that and of some of the insights from uh, from those discussions? Yeah. So I think we picked up that topic very timely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with the coronavirus, the work has completely changed, mm -hmm. and so had workforce to change as well. Mm -hmm. What we've done, as you remember, we held 10 panels around the world mm -hmm. and we spoke to uh, people from uh, developing uh, regions in the world, mm -hmm. developing workforce regions, to very well establish and develop. Mm -hmm. So we started um, opportunistically from Singapore, but thereafter China, India, South Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa actually and Latin America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then swung back to Middle East and North Africa and Europe and mm -hmm. only to go to US and Canada. What was surprising to me uh, is similarities between undeveloped and developed regions in terms of, for example, lack of the broadband access mm -hmm. which entirely influence how you have the remote workforce. Mm -hmm. Uh, the same is true for academia, which was very much unprepared to teach remotely. Now, broadband existed in certain regions, but not all professors were equipped mm -hmm. to teach AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that uncovered all kinds of other implications on how industry wasn't uh, being delivered, people out of academia ready to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to work. Mm -hmm. So they, they didn't have all the training they needed. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I know you're working on other things, uh, Dana. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so I mentioned, I hinted at it with these roadmaps. Yeah, yeah. And we've done predictions. So mm -hmm. there's something in between which we call megatrends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So recently they invited me once, Roberto Soraco stepped down as the chair of Industry Advisory Board of Future Directions Committee, mm -hmm. which is looking at future directions, sure. initiatives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, and so working with staff, Bill Tonti specifically, and Kathy Grice, mm -hmm. uh, we came up with the notion of, and the need for addressing megatrends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we are now doing is we connect all these predictions into the megatrends, mm -hmm. and out of these megatrends come out initiatives that eventually lead into the roadmaps. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a logical workflow. So it'll be some future direction initiatives, that kind of thing. Exactly, but uh -huh. I'm focused on these megatrends. Right, okay. And I tie it back to the work, and mm -hmm. IEEE, and, and mm -hmm. many other uh, very uh, promising areas. It's fun when a lot of things come together. Well, working with uh, very capable people like you and others is, is always good. 
So what are your plans going forward? Are there other prediction-like efforts that interest you that you think you'd like to get involved in? Well, a good friend of mine from East Coast, Fred Douglas, told me, Dan, you're going to do these predictions until you're 90 years old. <laughs> uh, right? And uh, I, I think uh, I'm doing quite enough now. I maintain these uh, technology predictions annually. I do a lot of talks, keynotes, mm -hmm. uh, now with these uh, mega trends and future workforce. Mm -hmm. My hands are really full with it. Yeah. And I know my manager, he'll, he'll ask me, Dan, <laughs> can you slow down that a little bit? <laughs> and do you have any recommendations to, for younger folks? Well, be brave, you know, look in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, look in the future for yourself, for your mm -hmm. family, for your work, for the whole nation and the whole of humanity. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Dehan. It's been a real pleasure to be able to, uh, to join Dehan here and talk to him about uh, uh, to interviewing him, because he's usually the interviewer for these, uh, for these uh, podcasts. So thank you very much, Dehan. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom.